Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us today for the weekly Wednesday workshop. I'm Felicia Bell in the Gulf States Regional Office located in Jackson, Mississippi. And today we have a wonderful topic as well as one of our specialists in our Southwest Regional Office, Colin Mitchell. And I am going to give the floor to him to introduce himself, a little backstory if he choose to, and we will go right into his presentation. Thanks, Colin, for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Felicia. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this and yeah, happy to be here. I mean, I'm here virtually, but I'm at home. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Felicia said, my name is Colin Mitchell. I'm a sustainable ag specialist out of our Southwest office in San Antonio, Texas. Um, today, we're going to cover Permaculture 101. It's really going to be more of a, cra a crash course into the design principles and some of the ethics and background about how permaculture was created. And my goal, you know, is that when I talk about permaculture or teach permaculture practices that really any type of farmer, no matter your scale, can take something home. Um, you know, we're going to do a little housekeeping first. Um, click into PowerPoint, that'd be good. Um, if y'all happen to be not familiar with Atra for some reason, um, this is our helpline down at the bottom and our ask and ag at incat.org for help uh, with email, via email. Um, you know, if you can't get a hold of Felicia or get a hold of me or in the field or on vacation for some reason, uh, we're here for technical assistance to help y'all out, you know, basically any time. Um, give us a call at that where there's people like me and Felicia nationally. So, and head to our, you know, our website for um, publications, blogs, videos, and same thing with our YouTube channel. Um, so a little about me, um, I was born and raised in the Texas Hill Country. That's kind of what it looks like down at the bottom. Um, really hilly, really rocky, um, just born just north of San Antonio and in between Austin. Um, is kind of where I come from. Um, I spent a lot of time outside relatively as a kid. Um, not a ton. There wasn't a ton of ag background in my family. My grandfather's family had a farm in North Dakota, but it burned down and he joined the Navy and that's how he ended up in Texas. And uh, the other part of my family immigrated from England. So um, that's, you know, what my home looks like when I think of it. It doesn't always look that green and uh, full of water. We get a lot of droughts and a lot of flash floods. It's very all or nothing with us here in Central Texas. Um, and my background on how I got started in ag, I graduated from the University of Texas in Austin, um, was it 2013? And um, a couple years later, after working you know, in outdoor shops and trying to figure out what I wanted to do after deciding I didn't want to be an environmental lawyer um, because I had this romanticized idea in my head that I could be outside and be in the wilderness and be an environmental lawyer, and that's not a thing. Um, so I took off to the Permaculture Research Institute of Australia to um, take part in an internship. I was there for about 10 months. Um, I lived in a tent the entire time and we did just about anything you could imagine. We did um, multi-paddock grazing um, with cows, what is it, goats, chickens, turkeys, geese, and we had some rabbits too. Um, food forestry, agroforestry, um, we had main kitchen gardens. We also did row crops as well and uh, adopted kind of permaculture and regenerative agriculture practices, some natural building, um, a lot of water management. That is me there on the right building a swale. I dug that all by hand um, over a couple of days uh, amongst other things. And um, that was a great experience. And that really got my foot in the door um, with permaculture and regenerative agriculture. After that, I took off to back home, central Texas. Um, and I worked on a, agrarian neighborhood. So it was a new housing development that uh, wanted to kind of mitigate that problem of uh, losing farmland here in Central Texas. Austin and San Antonio are booming cities and um, that was kind of the goal. And you know, um, after that, I just, that kind of ended up um, failing out a little bit and you know, just with the developer, things didn't come to fruition. And I just took off and lived in the back of my truck and worked in California, Oregon and other parts of Texas. For a couple of years and then two years ago i got hired by incat so um that's kind of a little bit about me the crash course and my life recently and i really loved working for incat and working on carbon markets regenerative agriculture and grazing and you kind of name it we kind of do it here which is great 
Um, so let's get into permaculture. So what is permaculture? I highlighted actually some stuff. I kept my camera on because my internet's working great. So that's awesome. This is the permaculture designer's manual. Um, this is the by Bill Molson and David Holgram. And these are the two gentlemen that um, coined the term permaculture. So I'm just going to read a little excerpt from the book because um, I feel like their description, the little paragraph description kind of nails it perfectly. And permaculture stands for permanent agriculture. It's a fusion of the two words. And it is the conscious design and maintenance of agriculturally productive ecosystems, which have the diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems. It is the harmonious integration of landscape and people providing their food, energy, shelter, and other material and non-material needs in a sustainable way. Permaculture design is a system of assembling conceptual, material, and strategic components this is the problem. In a pattern which functions to benefit life in all its forms. The philosophy behind, the perma behind permaculture is one of working with rather than, than against nature, of protracted and thoughts, thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless action, of looking at systems and all their functions rather than asking only one yield of them and allowing systems to demonstrate their own evolutions. So, you know, these are some different examples you see on your screen of permaculture and once we go through you know if you're not familiar with it we'll go through some of the design systems and things like that and honestly some of y'all's farms may already kind of look similar like that uh quite like this and so the origins of permaculture really bill molson and david holgram were observing nature um, it started out as a white paper they wrote bill molson was a uh, professor at a university in tasmania david holgram um, was his student and they kind of came up with this um, idea of mimicking nature and things like that and having agriculture systems that mimic nature. You know, sometimes we call it agroecology, sometimes we call it regenerative agriculture. Um, permaculture has its own spin on it, but really they got these um, ideas from an assembly of observations and design principles that came from a lot of indigenous and traditional cultures around the world. This is um, I think I want to, you know, make clear that permaculture is nothing new. Um, traditional cultures, Native American tribes, um, and folks um, like that have been doing this forever. You know, they survived without a giant tractor and, you know, buying fertilizer at the store for thousands of years. Um, and I know, Felicia, you wanted to speak on this a little bit, so I wanted to make sure I could pass it off to you for that. Yeah, no, just just want to back up what you said. It it is, and because what I've known and noticed rather in when we're teaching this, so many of our farmers are getting it, feeling like, oh, I don't know what this is, or is something new. And I always stress, and you just pointed it out that this is basically being placed in a book. So it's taking traditional knowledge, but put it in a format that others around the world could learn from. And so I always try to tell our farmers that the ones that have been doing this or raised in this manner, that is nothing new, you're already doing it. So you, you touched on it, but always want to give homage to traditional cultures around the world that have done uh, this. It just now have been put a name on it and put a name to it. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, me and you, Felicia, talked to both of our grandparents. This is how they farmed. You know what I mean? It was, this is how it worked. Um, and I think, you know, the importance of the book is that some people, you know, with whether it's colonization or westernization or the Green Revolution, we may have forgotten some of these things. Um, so it, it is a good tool for, I think, relearning some of the principles um, that have been, you know, forgotten. But there's also a lot of indigenous and traditional cultures through the Middle East, Southeast Asia here in America that still practice a lot of agriculture this way. And there's tons to learn from them. Um, and permaculture also combines that traditional genius with modern tech, appropriate technology with NCAT, National Center for Appropriate Technology, really feels like it hits on the nose. Um, and you know, that doesn't mean buying the latest and greatest thing, but maybe you can use some tools, tractor, um, soil moisture, monitoring meters, things like that, that could help you make decisions and be more regenerative and sustainable and work with nature better. Um, so there really are th may, three main ethics at the core of permaculture, uh, care of the earth, care of people, and care of returns or 
fair share. And this one has a, is a little bit convoluted and it can be, depending who you talk to, mean different things. Um, care for the earth is simple. If you have an ethic and caring for the earth while you're producing agriculture, you know, agriculture products, um, it will in turn take care of you. The, you know, you need a lot of those ecosystem functions we have that are natural to produce food and taking care of those will make you resilient and sustainable. Um, care of people, you know, I think a big tenet of sustainable agriculture that sometimes gets left out is people, you know, it's not sustainable if people are not cared for, there's not, you know, decent wages or can't feed yourselves or be healthy. Um, it's not going to last for the long haul and won't be a permanent agriculture system. And the other one, uh, care of returns or fair share. Um, I typically phrase this one as return of surplus. Um, so if, you know, there's excess money in a year, maybe you'll buy a new tool and or invest in developing a new part of your farm and you're returning that back into your farm. Maybe you have extra time, things are going great and it's winter time. Um, us in the South, not as much of a problem. We, you know, we don't get much of uh, off season in the winter versus our colleagues in Vermont and people, places like that. But, you know, maybe you can go volunteer, um, spend some time like that. Permaculture definitely brings in some um, community ethics and things like that. And uh, this is where that really kind of hits off there. And then we're going to move on to the 12 design principles. And this is where, honestly, we're going to spend most of our time. I didn't go really into the chapters or necessarily, this is how you do this technique, um, because it's going to look different on each farm, each ranch, each homestead. And for me to tell you, do this thing, and it's permaculture, uh, I feel is wrong. Um, I feel like it depends on your time, your energy. Is this a part-time job, a full-time job? Um, what is, you know, can your family help? Is it just you out there doing it alone? Um, so I really wanted to just focus on these 12 design principles. So that way, no matter your size, no matter your scale, um, there's something that you could take away um, and maybe think about and apply to your farm or ranch and have that kind of thought process. And this is kind of a big feedback loop for me when I was um, not farming right now, but maybe again soon. Um, but this is a good feedback loop that I, when I was farming and ranching, that I would always think about, you know, why I'm out there, what I'm, and going through the process of designing um, systems. And a lot of this is, you know, when I talk about design, um, a lot of you already have houses and things like that. Does it, that doesn't mean you need to, you know, tear down your house and redesign everything. Um, this is maybe just thought process or designing a garden bed. It could be designing a different paddock. It could be designing new agroforestry system or if you got a new property you bought that's the case too um so let's start with the first one which is you know all the other ones are important but without this one observe and interact you're going to be kind of lost um take time when you're on your property um whether it's your farm or your ranch to look around and observe what's going on um you know when i was farming i would get and you know get on a roll and you start weeding, you're just down looking, kind of moving to the next spot, moving to the next spot. But I would always make sure every, you know, 30 minutes, stop for a couple minutes, look around, see what's going on. Maybe look at the soil, get a different perspective. Um, and I feel like that's really important. And that also means observing what's happening in different seasons and different conditions. What does your farm or ranch look like when it pours? What does it look like in drought? Uh, where is water standing in your field? Um, I think a huge part of this is keeping that farm journal. Um, that always helped me a lot, you know, looking back to the past year. I, one of my good friends is a farmer in Oregon. He has a permaculture type farm. He doesn't call it that. Um, and he has a great journal. He looks back every day when he starts off, he looks back every day on that past couple of years, what was going on on the farm. Um, another way to observe and interact is to monitor what's going on. Maybe that means taking soil samples. Um, maybe that means once a year you go out, you get a coffee can and you pour water into it, time how long it takes for that water to go into your soil. Um, maybe that means taking pictures of your property and seeing how it changes over time. Um, maybe that means getting a rangeland or a botanist out there to see, you know, if you got a pasture, how those grasses are changing. Um, and something I've always found and why I've like permaculture, regenerative farming is there's always new discoveries in regenerative systems. They're always changing and there's always something to be learned and something to be observed. The second principle is to catch and store energy. 
Um, energy is moving through your property, whether it's sun, water, wind, and is there a way that you can harness that and use it to produce a yield? Um, a big one is using landscapes. If you think about the sun through um, the carbon cycle and through photosynthesis is creating carbon uh, in the soil. If you're using say a cover crop, um, it's taking CO2 out of the air. And if you let that um, cover crop stay on top and don't just pull it out or till it in, then you are storing carbon. You're using the sun's energy to store carbon, improve your soil, uh, water infiltration, water holding capacity, and things like that. Um, you know, there, you know, with landscapes, there's a way to store water, improving your soil health, whether it means um, building a berm and a swale, which we'll kind of look at in a second. I know that's a classic permaculture thing, but you don't always have to do that, guys. Um, so that's one way you could just put a bunch of wood chips down. Um, you'll see pictures of, I mentioned my farmer friend in Oregon, and he just laid a lot of wood chips down. And his, when you walk around on his farm, it feels like there's mycelium mats and it just soaks up water. Water doesn't leave his farm. It typically stays there and goes into the ground and then goes into the aquifer. Um, can you, you can use structures to store energy. Um, here in Texas, you know, I know some people that can't grow pomegranates. You know, this is an example. Once you get a little far north of where I live, it gets a little more challenging. We can get actual frosts and things like that. Um, but I know people that have put rows of pomegranate trees on the southern facing side of their house. That sun's energy is using to be able to extend that season um, and actually be able to produce pomegranates. They take them to the farmer's market. People love them. And it's later than you would normally be able to get them. And you can also, you know, of course, use solar energy, uh, wind energy, community solar, things like that. Um, also, housing design can work under that a little bit. Again, us in the south, typically, we're not trying to store heat. Um, we're typically trying to get rid of it and blast the air conditioning. Um, but that can play into it as well. And, you know, again, storing energy in the pantry instead of throwing food out or feeding it to the pigs, can you can things? You know, that's a, that's a classic one. My grandpa was always canning things all the time. I always had canned stuff. Um, so, you know, we were talking store and water. Um, that is the farm I mentioned in Oregon there on the left. Um, pretty, pretty robust. And when it rains, it all just sucks right in. Um, and on the top there, that is your classic kind of Berman swale. They don't have trees on there. A lot of times swales are used for um, planting trees. And what that is, it's an iron contour ditch that is level. And depending who you talk to, they may say it's not level because you may want it to drain if you have mosquito issues, um, you know, especially if you're working in um, nations that have malaria issues, you don't want standing water around necessarily. Um, but if essentially it creates a little extra pulse of rainwater that can go into your soil and be used to grow trees, especially in droughty areas like where I live here in Texas, um, that gives your trees a little bit extra pulse of water. Um, that needs it because sometimes it doesn't rain for five months here. Um, and you can do that with rocks as well. I know a um, ecological restoration practitioner in Saudi Arabia that has done that same thing, but he just used rocks on contour because it rains even less there. And he started to have plants come up that was a dry desert uh, area. And another one uh, there on the bottom of classic storing water structures, rainwater tanks, uh, great way you know, feed your garden, feed some animals if you got a small group of animals. The third one is to obtain a yield. Um, you know, you can't work on an empty stomach. You need to get something out of your farm or your garden or your ranch. Um, and it's best to kind of work with nature to obtain that yield. And also that means in some cases, if you're a, um, you know, you do this for a living, this is what you sell, is um, obtain a yield, ideally monetarily, so you can invest that back into your farm and your family. Um, and I think also obtaining a yield of something that improves your life, maybe that doesn't mean just financially, maybe that means nutrition, you're a big real crop farmer with 15,000 acres, but you don't have a garden. Maybe, you, you know, you got 15,000 acres, plant a little garden for yourself, that'll take care of you in the long term, and net a yield in your health. And it's also has to do with quality of life, happiness and health. Um, personally working in, you know, kind of regenerative systems that are combined and integrated, like a lot of permaculture systems, those have really, I've enjoyed those and my quality of health has been and happiness has been a lot higher. Um, you're still out there busting it, but you know, you are doing something different. 
and kind of mixing it up every day. And I've always really enjoyed that. And sometimes if you're an agroforestry system, you're working in the shade, which is pretty great in the middle of summer. Um, and this is all so is worth considering, like, when do you scale? How big do I go? Um, am I going to attain a yield if I go really big or should I stay kind of small and work my way up? The fourth principle is to apply self-regulation and accept feedback. So designing and working in agriculture systems is a very iterative process. It is very much a feedback loop. Every season's a loop. Um, every time I do something, I always go through this little feedback loop of collecting information, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Um, I may share that and bounce that off of people and kind of get a feel for what they're thinking, whether I'm farming with them or farmer friends I have around the country and internationally, um, you know, I'll reflect on that, um, whether it's writing it down, uh, pontificating more than I need to, uh, going on a walk, um, develop ideas for change. Once you kind of figure out what was good, what was bad, what was okay, what would I like to look at this in short term, long term, where does all that fit? Implement what you feel is appropriate. And then you kind of repeat that whole thing over again. Um, Maybe a bit masochistic, but I always feel like um, there's always more to improve, and always uh, we can always do better when our with our farm systems. And if you reach to the part where everything's running pretty smoothly and you feel pretty relaxed, um, maybe there's something else you can do. And again, the, I brought up farm journals before, but I just can't stress enough how great uh, farm journals are. And I think making sure you accept that feedback, um, you can do a spot where sometimes you question yourself too much, but get to a point where you feel comfortable and confident with what you believe and move forward. Um, don't let this apply self-regulation, accept feedback, uh, get, into, get you into analysis paralysis. Um, you know, still, you know, keep moving forward when you can. And the fifth one is to use and value renewable resources and services. Um, and this is really putting a value back on ecosystem services that I mentioned earlier. And these are really the benefits we get from society. Um, part of that is, you know, food and timber. That's great. Um, but we also get air, clean air. We get clean water from functioning, healthy ecosystems. Um, you know, we get the carbon cycle. We get mineral cycles that help support our agricultural systems. And, you know, these are really done through regenerative practices, permaculture, agroecology practices. And two of the big ones that we could really do and really improve that is restoring forests and soils. Um, and I think, you know, other examples on your farm would be um, saving seeds. You know, that's a renewable resource right there. If you can, you get to a certain scale, you probably can't. Um, but, you know, maybe you save just a little bit. Um, and renewable and energy efficient energy is a part of that. Some of that can be pretty costly, but um, those are things to look for. And also using animals is great. Um, if you want to talk about improving your soil health, animals can be fantastic for that if they're managed appropriately. Um, you know, we've, there's some things, if you're selling your food, you got to watch out with uh, food safety and FSMA and all that. Um, but we used to always integrate chickens into our garden when it was time to get into bed. We had those little mobile chicken tractors and they would weed up everything, eat up pests, and we'd come in with a chip hoe and get everything else out and move on, plant, plant everything up and reform the beds a little bit with hose and we were good to go. Um, and that's going to look different again for all of y'all. So uh, that's just one small example. So look where you can and really put your value in renewable resources, whether it's alive or dead or semi alive. And the sixth one, um, you know, I grew up in the area of reduce, reuse, recycle, um, but produce no or less waste if you can. Um, I don't know, I, I think I know every farmer that has a resource pile. It's not a junk pile or a trash pile, it's a resource pile. Um, and I think that's really important. You know, farmers are thrifty out there doing what we can. Um, and these are kind of different steps you can go through. Refuse it, do I really need it? I think that's good for everyone in everyday life. Do I need the new iPhone? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that's an uh, important thing to look at. You know, looking at, when you're looking at new equipment, okay, do I need, which no-till drill do I want if I have a really big property, which, you know, things like that. Um, reduce is great. Um, you can you reduce your water consumption, but still get a yield? Can you reduce the amount of plastic you buy? Great. Uh, reuse, and this one and repair, I think the ones farmers are awesome at is reusing anything and everything, no matter what you got. You know, I've made trellises out of 
all sorts of stuff, bamboo, um, old chain link fence. Yeah, just about anything you can make a trellis out of. Um, but reusing things is essential and it makes you more sustainable as a farmer and being able to repair things. If you can fix your tractor, instead of paying somebody to do it, you're gonna save some dollars and get a better yield. And then uh, recycling things if you can. And maybe also it means re redesigning a system that you have or redesigning a workflow or so you don't waste more of your time. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, but those are different options. That's kind of a last option is like, maybe I need to kind of rethink this whole, th this area of my farm and go through that. So we're gonna spend more time on this one um, and it's designed from pattern to detail. And this is that old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. And really the idea is to start with the patterns that kind of rule our lives and our behaviors and maybe the interactions on your farm and then go down into the details. And I put this picture, this is again, that farm in Oregon. You can see that it's going from bigger beds. We're going with more paths. Where am I walking on the farm? How do I move through the farm? And then it goes down smaller to what am I gonna plant in this bed? And it is a form of holistic thinking and it's whole systems thinking is a really, um, really important in permaculture design or regenerative agriculture is how does this all work together? And I think, let's go ahead and go to the next one. And whole systems design really encompasses all of these things. You have land use planning, your health and nutrition, as well as your community, your farmer, your rancher, you're providing for the health of your family, your community. Um, can I restore some of these ecological systems? Um, the actual agriculture practices you're practicing, building soil, uh, water development, taking care of your animals, the architecture of your house, and maybe some other buildings, um, your biological systems, developing your community. These are all aspects of an agricultural system, uh, wildlife habitat. And what we're gonna start with is those big three, and we're talking what are the um, big systems at play? What are the ones that are the kind of the ones we don't wanna change once we get it all set? And you know, I imagine most people here aren't gonna go, maybe you will go buy a new farm, but typically you would start with your water, your access and your structures. And those are the big things you kind of want to plan out. You know, water is really important. How does it move through your property? Where can I store it? And where can I let it go? Um, and a lot of that will also determine then my access. Then you move on, you know, where do I want to place my roads so they're efficient and don't necessarily mess up my water design, but do what you have to. You can always put a pipe under it. Um, it but, you know, looking at that, so you minim minimize erosion, um, and also things like that. Typically you would use a ridge if you had a, had a big valley farm, um, that's what you would use and go off of there. And then you're going to look at where to place your structures. Once that's set, you're not gonna move your house. So those are the kind of the big three mainframe designs when you're looking at a property, um, say if you got a new property um, that permaculture really hones in on. And I do wanna mention the key line scale of permanence, which was P.A. Yeoman, he was an Australian farmer. I don't know if y'all have ever seen those key line designs where you take your tractor and rip on, um, not necessarily on contour, but it's based on key line. Um, and what key line is, say you have a valley and it does that. That's your key point, the part where it starts to flatten out, if you kind of see my finger. Um, then you'll mimic that contour line across parts of your farm. And it's much more complicated than that. It'll change contours, uh, you know, if you get to a different spot. Um, but he also wanted to plan and have people plan their farms based off, um, you know, the permanence of that structure. And Regrarians has a d done a great job. It's another gentleman out of uh, Australia who I've met and I'm sorry, his name escapes me now. Um, I can picture his face, um, but he's fantastic. And what he's developed is a, kind of an iteration of permaculture. Everyone puts their little copy trademark on it. And his is a great, um, more updated version. And he had adapted the key line scale of permanence to go from climate. So uh, what are your weather patterns? How are they changing? Those are typically permanent. I mean, we're seeing some issues with climates changing and weather changing, things like that. but within a certain range, you're not gonna go from semi-arid to Arctic real quick. You know I mean? That's not gonna happen. Um, the second one is gonna be your geography. And that's to think about how does geography affecting my um, system, my farm, my ranch, my hills, my slopes. This is what, if you're gonna keyline rip or design 
um, some of your water features, which we move into water at three. Um, these, I mean, you can't really change the geography of your um, ranch or farm without maybe doing some extreme bulldozing or some dynamite, you know. Um, the third is your water. That means how much it rains and your water cycle and how much you will be able to really change that on a broad scale is going to be very minimal. But you can plan to change the water cycle on your farm by increasing water holding capacity of your soils and infiltration rates. You can um, design swales and berms or ponds and lakes and things like that, um, which is a part of key line design is figuring out the place and placement of those things. Um, but again, we're not going to go super in the details because that's a whole presentation on itself of where do I put a pond and how do I build a swale. Um, fourth is going to again be access. Five, you know, those are those, you can see those mainframe ones through three through six, but um, regarians and key line adds forestry in between access and buildings. Um, where you're going to place your trees is really important in permaculture and kind of regenerative agriculture. Um, we have kind of lost the knowledge of farming with trees in a lot of ways. And these are things that are gonna be a relatively permanent fixture and they're gonna be a long-term growing situation, whether it's a fruit tree, a timber tree, you name it, that's gonna be there as probably as long as you will. Um, you know, farm, to, farm for trees is something I always really, really like. Then you go into buildings and you work your way down to, after you figured out all these things, okay, where are my fences gonna go? Where are my cattle going to graze? This, you know, maybe this will design your paddocks. This will be where your gardens, your row crops, that where your fences are will help figure out that. Next, you can change your soil um, almost easier than you would some of these things. You know, here in the South, building soil can be a little more challenging. We get drought, we get hot uh, versus our friends, again, in the Northeast or the Northwest, they can sequester carbon a little bit easier and change soils, but we have full ability and regenerative agriculture to improve our soils. And then you move on to your economy and your energy. You can affect your economy with your business of being a regenerative uh, farmer and improve your rural communities and then um, energy. So again, we're going we're gonna to stay on this main, you know, whole system design one for a little bit um, and go through that kind of process. I think it's important to talk about it um, for from a permaculture stance, how you look through. And, you know, we just talked about the mainframe design, looking at all those things. You're also going to do a sector analysis and ignore those numbers for now. We're going to talk about those one, two, three, four, five in a minute. Um, it's important to look at where your summer sun and your winter sun is when you're growing crops. Um, how low does it go? Are you going to get a point where um, there's trees that block it? Um, what is your summer sun going to look like? How much of it do you have? Um, those are all great things for placement of plants and trees and things like that. It's also good to kind of list out and be aware of where your risks are. Um, you know, here in Texas, for example, we get hurricanes in the southeast, really, really intense cold fronts coming out of our northwest and give us these big thunderstorm lines that can give us sometimes, I mean, one time in the summer, we got a microburst of 10 inches in an hour and like 50 mile per hour winds. So that will help consider maybe I should put a line of trees there and put a windbreak there up in my, the northwest quadrant of my hypothetical farm. And where does fire typically come from? You know, if I'm in up in Oregon, typically that really dry wind comes out of the east and moves from east to west. What can I do there? Maybe I can put some ponds on my eastern side of my farm. Um, those are all really important things to kind of identify uh, with a sector analysis. It's a what are, where's, where's the good things come? Like my mountain view, where can some threats and risks come from and just identifying where that sun moves across your property uh, through different parts of the year. And if you wanna do that, I always had a really good app on my phone. If you have an iPhone or something like that, um, uh, it's called Sun Surveyor. I used to do some permaculture consulting, go to people's farms and ranches and kind of help them design things. And that's a great app I really recommend. <coughs> and then next is uh, zones and that zone thinking. And this is really going to um, work into what we're going to talk about next, which is workflows, but how to think of things on your farm and as um, based on how many times you visit there, their importance um, and how much time they're going to take from you. And it's not going to look like a perfect circle or target. I've never been on a farm that looks like a perfect little target outward like that. Uh, zone zero is gonna be you, your family, your house. There's not really gonna be agriculture production maybe in your house, but um, zone one is gonna be areas needing continual observation. 
and uh, frequent visits. This is going to be kind of that finer gardening, your um, herbs, maybe your lettuces, your greens, um, things as you are in there. And zone two is going to be less intensively managed areas. Um, this is going to be more like, you know, I would say zone zero is probably going to be animals too. You know, maybe zone one, maybe more like livestock things like that. Um, it kind of depends. Our zone one would be chickens because you got to feed them every day. But if you don't feed them that much, maybe they'd be zone two. This is more your row crops. You don't really need to go visit them all the time. Um, they don't take as much intense management. If you're growing like a bunch of corn, you may have to weed it a few times, uh, things like that. Zone three is going to be occasionally visited areas. This is going to be like your orchards, you know, unless you're really, really pumping an orchard um, and this is that's the main thing you do you probably won't go out there a ton this is your food forest things like that uh, zone four would be wild food gathering if you have space for this uh, on your property um, it's important to note that you don't have to have all five zones that's not a requirement or anything like that you can go up to zone two and stop um, it, like I said every property every uh, farm every ranch is different zone four is going to be for wild food gathering wood cutting mushroom collection uh, self seeding trees and then five is going to be your natural unmanaged areas that are there for recreation and spiritual cultural purposes, going hiking, and hanging out. Um, so another design aspect of um, working from patterns to details is going to be your workflow. Um, and this is going to really deal with how you move through your farm. I don't know if y'all have ever worked on a farm where you have to walk back and forth across the farm about 70 acres. Um, forget a tool, okay, I broke a piece of irrigation, I gotta go back and sometimes you get nothing done. Um, I've done that multiple times. Uh, for one, we only had one truck on that farm, so I didn't have it <laughs> a couple of times. Um, and this really has to do with placing elements for efficiency. Um, how do you move through your farm? You know, if yet things kind of in place, look for other ways you can sprinkle things in to maybe make things more efficient. Um, but those are, that's something really worth considering just so again, obtaining that yield, this is really important. And then finally within design and working through there is analyze and connect components. Um, look at each component and analyze its needs, products, behaviors, characteristics, characteristics. This chicken is always like a big example from permaculture. You know, what does it need in each shelter, grit, dust, water, food? Um, you know, it breeds, it has different color. Some, some breeds have different uh, climate tolerance and behaviors, but it produces eggs, you get meat, you get feathers, it'll dig, you get poop in your garden, all those things. Um, and then how can we connect that based off on those needs and products and behaviors? So number eight and is gonna be integrate rather than segregate. And that's a big tenet of um, sustainable regenerative agriculture, permaculture, you name it is um, integrating these elements. So again, you know, back to that chicken, how can they all work together? Um, down on the left, you have a civil pasture example. You have cows eating forage, dropping manure and urine, fertilizing the trees, uh, but also getting shade. And then you have um, that there is going to be a um, kind of log patch that was used to build uh, uh, harvest oyster mushrooms, but you're also slowing down water, building organic matter in between as a pathway. Uh, but when those logs in there, you get a oyster mushroom harvest. So number nine is gonna to be to use small and slow solutions. Um, when you're doing that, they're typically easy to maintain and they're more stable. If you have really abrupt change, typically it can be um, quite fragile when that happens and won't necessarily ensure longevity. I think a good example is biostimulants. Um, if you go buy a package of uh, my, my, not, well, packaged mycorrhizal fungi or any other like beneficial bacteria and you spray it on, um, typically, those aren't going to work in the long term. From research I've seen and uh, researchers I've worked with, uh, most of the times with stock mycorrhizal fungi, the ones you buy won't actually survive. That um, the ones that you can produce yourself and use that nat native mycorrhizal fungi, which is slower to do and produce that inoculant, actually last in the soil. We work with a soil scientist in the Rio Grande Valley, and they bought a packaged one mycorrhizal fungi and then produce their own, all the stuff they bought died. So I think that's a great example. Um, slow, small and slow kind of wins the race. And I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna hurry along here, Felicia, I've got three left. Um, and to use and value diversity, um, this really helps ensure ecological resilience, a tenant of 
ecology is, the more diversity you have, the more stable your system is. And the truth is for farming, you know, if you're just an onion farmer and all your onions die, and then that can cause some issues um, and you're less resilient that way. And you protect species diversity that way. And, you know, some examples of doing this is polycultures, both perennial and annual or a combination of them. Uh, pollinator buffer strips have been shown to increase yields in some places, even though they take uh, some land out of production, uh, cover crops, and then multi-species livestock. Each, um, each animal or plant has a function and purpose within that system. And then using edges and value the margin. Um, so there's a increased and almost more productivity where two ecosystems meet. And ecotone is a term um, that highlights the transition from one ecosystem to another. And you have both, you have species from both that meet there. And I think that can, I don't think that creates a um, increased diversity, increased yields, increased opportunity. Um, a great example is alley cropping there. You have, can have some season extension here in the South, it gets really hot. You know, that, that increases, um, um, you know, like lettuce season extension, things like that. And then you can use that edge um, to, there's more, uh, if you use edge, there's more opportunities there along that um, area. Another one is gonna be pond design, but you know, here in the America, we don't grow much food in our ponds. Um, if you go to Southeast Asia, they'll grow water spinach and things like that. And there's lots of opportunities in those areas and have um, koi fish and other fish ponds um, that they eat. And lastly, but not least, is creatively use and respond to change. Um, plan and design for known changes, that's your seasons. Um, thinking about your stages of succession, and that's, you know, moving from grass to shrubs to trees, um, lichens if you start first and thinking about those and realizing that using maybe agroforestry or food forestry and planting wood chips you can move from a bacterial early stage of succession up to a mature stage of succession succession pretty quickly um, and really responding to that and adapting to the unknowns um, so i wanted to make sure we had time for q a so let's go ahead and stop there and there's my email if y'all would ever like to talk give me a ring uh, shoot me an email. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you all, and I look forward to any questions we have. Thanks so much, Colin. That was so informative. I'm over here taking notes. <laughs> I appreciate that so much. So I want to go to the chat, but if anyone has this burning, burning question, please unmute yourself. Let me make sure I have allowed that. And you should be able to unmute yourself and come on and ask a question And as I'm looking through the chat. Hello, my name is Russell with Tuskegee University. Hey Russell, how's it going? Great, great to be on. The, uh, I know this was the basics of getting in and I like it, it was really great information. And I, is there any information or does Atra have some I haven't looked yet because like I said, we use a lot of your, your material in our trainings. Um, on actually the material use in uh, permaculture, and I'll give you an example. There's one of our clients, he uses um, hay, hay that has not gone to uh, seed or it makes sure that the hay has not used gray zone or any type of uh, uh, herbicide that would hurt him. So he uses all of that and he plants inside of the hay and he just stacks on the hay stacks back on the hay and he uses that all as his planting medium. But one of the biggest problems we have with using that in permaculture, being in the South, of course you're in the South as well, are uh, fire ants and other insects that would hold over into the uh, medium of that perma permaculture itself. So there are different mediums that it, uh, that's available. That was, that was one of the biggest drawbacks. So as far as actual resources we have on that, I'm not super sure, Felicia. You know, I don't think we have much in form of permaculture. Maybe I should write something one of these yeah. days. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We, we don't have a lot. No. Okay. Um, and as far as medium, you know, the problem with the fire ants, um, you know, that you could always uh, incorporate maybe some sort of biosolarization that may um, mitigate those ants. Um, you know, I've run that, especially with T-tape, if you have your T-tape since empty, if that's what he's using under his hay, I've had those get full of ants before and had to flush them out. Um, 
because I've used a lot of hay before too, and you know it does definitely shelter them through the winter time a little bit. Um, so maybe you know there's always wood chips that could be used, and maybe they won't like that as much because I'm trying to think of like air pockets that it creates. Um, that may take some more thought. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Felicia? Those are the main two. I was getting ready to say as well, um, utilizing sometimes herbs and trees that they don't yeah. like, like cedar and possibly uh, growing herbs mm -hmm. around that area that they're, because I've used hay yeah. bales as well to grow in, um, but really finding out what are the natural things that ants don't like and then put that there. Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of deter them if you don't want to use, you know, chemical type things to, to remove them or keep them at bay. Yeah, that's a great point, Felicia. Yeah, like mint is an example that people yes. always like harp on. And, you know, maybe there's like a mint tea or, you know, there's uh, people that ferment different weeds. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could ferment with some and make some wheat, uh, some mint juice or something like that and kind of trial and error some of these things and see how it does. Of course, you know, when it rains, you may have to do it again. But um, yes. I think that's definitely a great consideration, depending on a scale. You know, like I know some mm -hmm. farmers that had 100 yeah. acres of tomatoes and Texas, I'm not going to tell them to plant mint. So yeah. um, if you use on a smaller scale, I think that's a great, great suggestion for sure. Exactly. I know uh, cinnamon, um, cayenne pepper, those type black pepper and just making a um, spray out of some of those peppers, even jalapeno. Yeah. If you grew some jalapeno peppers or any type of hot peppers and making a spray out of it. But like Colin said, that's a reoccurrence. You're going to have to keep... Um, always you know putting that on your land after rain um but it is some natural ways to keep the ants away yeah that's what we do for deer here in central texas we have tons of deer and that helps quite a bit thank you oh you said mentioned wood chip chips now, i always find that um we don't depending on what wood chips you use because wood chips that you put in uh it can it will zap the nitrogen out of the soil so normally when I use the wood chips, I use them maybe down the aisles, but not but not in the growing medium itself unless they've been composted. Yeah, and I know people that have done both and they may do a light wood chip layer um, and then, or they do, they alternate their beds. So what becomes, was their path becomes their rows. Uh, that farm I showed you all in Oregon, he does that quite a bit. And that has worked really well for him of building up his organic matter. Um, and the nitrogen thing, if you, you know, maybe you can plant a cover crop, it really depends on how his cycles work. Yeah. And wood chips definitely has that caveat of, um, you may have to integrate a couple other practices in there, um, without having to go buy some, you know, fish hydrolysate or something like that. Any other questions? You, you could come on now, unmute yourself. And we do have enough time. I want Colin, it, you know, as, as long as people want to stay, we, yeah. we try to make sure we answer everyone's questions. Of course, if people have to leave, you have to leave. Uh, but we don't like to just cut it short when, when the information is being shared and, and explained. So um, if not any questions or if you have to think of, I wanted to thank Miss Selena um, for your comment, um, we want to always uh, make sure that we are respecting all indigenous knowledge of permaculture. So thank you so much for that comment. Um, it's just so, so many cultures around the world that live and do this daily. And, and also I put in the chat that also the, the ones of us that have learned from our cultural heritage that are doing it today um, you know, always have a respect for those farmers um, that continue that. Uh, so thank you for the comment, Mr. Russell. Thank you for your comment uh, about most small farmers uh, use indigenous mm -hmm. practices because, yeah, we, yeah, a lot of times, one, we most times start out with limited resource. We don't want to, you know, put thousands and thousands of dollars into uh, a new endeavor if we don't know if it's going to work yet. So we kind of do some experimentation. Most farmers, I always say, are researchers. Uh, and we do experiments on our farm. So thank you for that. Um, 
And yeah, Mr. Russell, we use all of these points and it comes natural to farmers out of necessity. And, and that usually is sometimes small to medium farmers, most of, and I'm assuming Mr. Russell meant the principles. Uh, usually these mm -hmm. principles come natural to most farmers. And, and that's what we're speaking on when we spoke about indigenous cultures. These principles are utilized, but they haven't been defined. And that's what I always want to give credit to permaculture and Bill Mullison in putting it in a book and defining uh, what these cultures are doing um, around the world and even in our country. Um, now, Mr. Greg, can you come on if you would like? Could you explain the Von Thunen model? I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Do you mind coming on? May not still be here. Colin, are you familiar with that particular method? No, I was going to actually look on my other laptop real quick. Um, I'd be happy to answer. I did see a question about Korean natural farming, and we could um, come back to that. OK. Um, oh, uh, Ms. Whitney asked if you could share the permaculture book. Can you give title and, and all of that again? Um, so it's the Permaculture, a Designer's Manual. This is by Bill Mollison. Um, if you want to email me, I may have a copy of it. I'm not sure. Um, online or digital, I'll have a resource for y'all. Um, so my email, I think, should still be up there. And there's also a couple other uh, books that are out. People like Matt Powers has kind of redeveloped it and tried to make it a little updated. And then uh, Regrarians is a pretty great option, though. They're a little expensive. They do more of an online learning platform and have some kind of uh, other courses, but um, those people are all, folks are all really fantastic. Uh, said the PDC manual is great. Um, it's pretty dense. It's about, uh, I got it with me, 500 pages. So, wow. um, and you know, they're all like hand-drawn, like kind of diagrams and things like that. Wow. So, you know, it's not the <laughs> most up-to-date thing, but it still works great. I've read it through it a couple of times, especially when I was working in Australia at the permaculture design, uh, or Permaculture Research Institute, so. Wow, that's amazing. We we also, the question is, will borax and sugar work? And I, I think Mr. Cork is talking about with ants, because mm -hmm. I think I have seen that. Um, yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, yeah, uh, borax. And one of the things we did experiment, oh my goodness, many, many years ago um, with the, what, the pink and the blue, uh, synthetic sugars, the, the, the sugar packets that usually on your table. Um, my son did an experiment many, many years ago, and that will get rid of, <laughs> as sad to say. Um, but yeah, you just poured them on there and, and they left the bed itself. They did not like that at all. Just, you know, it's aspartame and it's, it's just synthetic. And so the ants left that. So it's the pink and blue little packets. That's something you make it get really easy. Also, Mr. Rogers said the University of Texas at Austin fire ant project looks for ant predators and viruses. Oh, wow. Are That's you familiar good. with that, Colin? No, I'm a Texas ex. I should be. I feel like a bad... <laughs> a bad <laughs> Bad Longhorn. Um, that's new to me. Cool. I'm going to check that out. Wow. So I'm, ass I'm assuming, Mr. Roger, they're, they're using beneficials. They're, they're, I'm assuming that's what I'm understanding, that they're utilizing beneficial insects and, and viruses and different things to kind of ward off the fire. And is I'm, am I understanding that correctly, Colin? <laughs> that may be right. Um, okay. Said I have to look into that program at UT. Wow. They, they don't do That's too much amazing. agriculture, but um, I'm going to look that up. Cool. Wow. And then Korean natural farming techniques. There were various ideas of fermenting plants to create natural fertilizer. Do you use or know about these? So I've done a little bit of Korean natural farming here in Texas and in Australia. Um, you know, depending what you do, you know, there's ones that create a... Um, EM, which I believe is, if I remember correctly, effective microorganism. And the idea is you go plant, a, you kind of parboil this rice and you go plant it in a forest under a tree. 
and then it'll kind of develop a lot of the native mycorrhizae bacteria there. And then you, I think you put it into some rice bran, if I remember. And there's different stages in moving on up and you basically create different ferments. Um, you know, one way is also making bokashi. It's a way of fermenting your food waste. And I've done a lot of that. Um, it can be pretty acidic. So you want to plant it and bury it. Um, and then at least I like to do kind of at least six inches, probably more like a foot and then let it sit for at least two weeks, let it break down a little bit more, and then you'll plant it, uh, plant into it, good to go. You can use the juice too from the uh, Bokashi, but just water it down quite a bit. And then there's also, you know, if there's maybe certain minerals you don't have, um, kind of knowing some different plants, you could do ferments of those certain plants like yarrow or um, something that's really high in silica and use that as a fertilizer method. Um, I think it works great on a small scale. It takes a little bit of technique and time, especially those EM processes I was talking about. I've definitely got all the way to EM2 and just, you know, destroyed it. Um, there's a terrific guy out of Hawaii um, that I took a class from here in Central Texas. Um, I can't remember his name, but if you look up KNF Hawaii, he's pretty tremendous. Um, I think it's really interesting. And um, we even had a guy when I was in Australia come from, there's a permaculture center in um, Southeast Asia, I think it was in Malaysia, and he would, he came and kind of like showed us some of this stuff. And I think it's a really interesting um, practice that's been used for a long time. And I think, you know, again, that accepting feedback and regulating and going through, it's a great idea, you know, um, I think it's a good thing to play with. Um, and it, it can be really beneficial for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, we have one comment, diatomaceous earth can help. Um, even, you know, with the reapplication, same with the reapplication. Yeah. So yes, diatomation yeah. earth. We got one, and I think it was on your slide, the name of the farm in Oregon you were referring to. Yeah. So that's my, uh, good friend, Andre Miller. Um, he, his farm name, he doesn't have a website. I don't think, um, he's, I think about two acres, but he has an Instagram. Um, he deleted all some social media recently, but his wife mm -hmm. is running it. They're doing some agritourism. It's roots fitness farm, Portland but he's in kind of the Mount Hood area, kind of if you're familiar with Portland, Southeast of there. Um, I grew up, you know, I met him in Texas. He's actually the one who kind of told me about permaculture. And I was like, cool, I'm gonna go to Australia and do this internship and give it a try. Um, and he's done a tremendous job just in the past, well, what wow. is it, four years? He, you know, he started four years ago. And then, like I said, it's insane. Like there's just plants taller than me everywhere. It feels like you're walking on a trampoline when you're walking on his mycelium paths and he's done a great job in four years. And I went up there for a little bit and kind of when he was starting out and spent some time with him and worked through some stuff with him. And it was really great. I go see him whenever I can. Wow. That's amazing. Um, and Mr. Ian saying my experience, fire ants prefer acidic soil. Yes. And also, um, uh, weeds <laughs> and different things when we see all of these different because we have dormant seeds so when you see kind of the evasive stuff coming up things you have never seen before it's usually the pH and so Mr. Ian is saying we you know most of the fires will leave when they get the pH back right for that that pasture and stuff and that is so correct um, yeah, yeah most people that the pH is so so important um, to get right and, and even it out for your land. And like Colin said, it's going to be different from air, for every uh, situation based upon what you're growing or raising um, for yeah. your animals and stuff. Yeah, um, like here in Central Texas, we have super basic soils because there's limestone everywhere. So oh, wow. the fish <laughs> open we have in the whole country. Now, this is a good question, Colin. The difference between permaculture and regenerative ag. <laughs> Man, so I may, some people who are like really heavy permaculture folks may think I'm a bad permaculturist um, because I typically just take the tools and some of the ethics and I'd pick and choose what I want. Um, but I think it's that those ethics that they bring in, um, there's other chapters in the book about economies and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, you know, I... I think it's really those design principles for me. Um, you know, those are going to be part of regenerative agriculture, but just the way it's laid out. Um, and, you know, regenerative agriculture can be on a larger scale and a smaller scale too. Um, like I said, I'm a permaculture des certified designer, but 
I can I kind of put everything under an umbrella and take and pick what works for you and doesn't work for you from kind of each of them. I feel like regenerative agriculture is now just like a big umbrella term and permaculture is more those ethics and things like that of working with the land, even though that's part of regenerative agriculture, but it's tries to become its own pillar and there's a lot of back and forth. It gets confusing. I know a lot of guys who were trained at the Permaculture Research Institute with me and gals, and they just dropped using the word permaculture, even though it's technically permaculture. So it's uh, it gets a little convoluted sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really does. Yeah. And, and again, I always just like to stress is, you know, looking up the definition, but you'd be so surprised when you do that, you're like, well, that may be what we're doing. And, yeah. or, you know, if it's a friend's land, you know, I, I just try always to think about what you want to do on your land and not getting caught up in the terminology, because at the end of the day, we all have to work on our land. And so we, but we need to do it the way we see fit. Um, but you can glean from so many methodologies. So, uh, you know, you don't have to hone in on just one um, because our, <laughs> each property has a microclimate. And so you may be gleaning from many uh, uh, methodologies and, and, and traditional things out there, but don't stress about it. Don't stress about it and stuff because you'd be very surprised that your land is going to do its thing. That's nature. It, yeah. We cannot control it, even though a lot of people try, <laughs> but you just, you cannot control it. And so we do the best we can. That's, that's all that is asked of us when we're trying to produce food and for ourselves and others. So, um, question here, is there a recommended practice for urban permaculture? Um, this gentleman has a quarter of an acre, but want to adhere to neighborhood covenants. See, this is very important. Yes. He planted a peace tree many years ago, um, but it has never produced fruit and then have noticed the clear fungus on some of the branches. So do I need to scrap it for smoking chips? Like, you know, or, or kind of let the years go on. That's basically either or. Ooh, that's a, there's a lot of factors in that one. I think knowing where you are, because okay. in the hill country here, I'm in San Antonio right now, and it's a lot more humid. You go 30 minutes north of me, peaches grow a lot better. It's a big industry up there. Down here, they get hit with mold and um, all sorts of bugs and things like that. Um, um, oh, someone said they know Andre. Great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got lost in the chat. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it depends on design. Um, man, yeah, every system's different. I'd have to look at the shape of it, where your sun is, um, what side of maybe a house or a building it's on. I, I'm working on a Texas urban agroforestry project where we're creating urban agroforestry design materials for the US Forest Service. And I'm thinking through all the things I would, I'm gonna do for that. And um, I think it really depends on if you, um, I don't know who made that comment, but I'm happy to speak with you kind of offline so we could take a little more time because, yeah, that's always, it, it depends about nine ways, you know what I mean? Um, wow. But with the with the peach tree, if you're in a humid area, it could, could just be that it's not going to be a great fit and maybe, you know, being in the south if it's humid, maybe a fig or something like that. But figs also have creeping uh, roots and things like that. So um, depending on how old it is too, um, you know, we had fruit trees, um, peach trees especially in the hill country where I grew up and three years we would start to see them but we always just take the fruit off and throw it on the ground so it also depends on that so um I'd be my email's there my phone number if you'd would like to reach out to me I'd be happy to talk more about that great great one of the things I want to touch on before you made some comments um in your presentation you made to come up about livestock so I wanted to make sure that the audience understood that integrating livestock does not mean you have to be a livestock producer. So yeah. you can have two, three, it doesn't matter because you're trying to adhere to one uh, predator and prey. So you, you're trying to do that. Um, and this is for, you know, someone at least having some acreage, uh, not a backyard for with animals. But, um, and also of course the manure. So when, when Colin said livestock, don't, don't get, you know, like, oh, I gotta raise animals. Yes, but it can also 
the smaller animals. Remember Colin said rabbits, chickens, it could be smaller animals that you really can manage versus a sheep, goat, and even possibly cattle. Uh, so just keep in mind when he said livestock, it really, really helps um, because you're keep you basically it's your fertilizer. So you're not buying off the farm fertilizer when you have those animals that really, really helps. That's, um, a, good, that's a great point. Yeah, you know, there's some systems I've worked in where they had five chickens, they move them along. And they just kind of plant behind it each time and they just go along the row and you get a continuous harvest that way, um, especially maybe in an urban setting. That's a great, great way to do it. Yeah, definitely. And principle six. Um, oh, what was it? I think principle six was the six was like reuse, like to recycle, yeah. I believe. The produce no waste or less, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to share with the uh, participants is machinery. I know Colin mentioned that. Also think about renting. Um, yeah. That's one thing. And, and sometimes we don't think of it. So that's why I'm saying it. I just throw it out there because sometimes we don't think about renting uh, equipment for farming because we're so uh, always thinking about having to buy equipment. And if it's some type of production that you're only using it once a year, you know, monetarily, I, you know, rent would be better. Now, if it's something you're using weekly, that that's something I feel like you should purchase. So that yeah. that just wanted to share that with you as well. Yeah. And if you're in a co-op, maybe your co-op can buy it and you mm -hmm. all can share it. Or there's some uh, uh, see, um, instances where like the Soil Water, Water Conservation District will buy a nice yeah. big tool, like a no-till drill and share it out. Those are all great, great options. Yeah. And then I say, Tiala, who knew Andre, if you see Andre, tell him I said hi. Um, <laughs> he said, your neighborhood has a tool li uh, library with rototiller, shovels, lawnmowers. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, that is nice because most neighborhoods don't have them, but that's something that, you know, everybody even on this call possibly can do within their neighborhood just to help out. Uh, but make it a cooperative where everybody is responsible, uh, maintenance, you know, you can make it where, you know, it's not on one person, but those two live tool libraries come in handy for sure. Another thing, Colin, you just mentioned is the Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, please check into that. That's, mm -hmm. that's around the country, regardless of where you are with the no-till drill. Um, I do know all of them don't have them, but, and then the ones sometimes in the larger, and I said larger areas, meaning the farmers have larger acreage, their no-till drill are for large acres. So it is mm. different size no-till yeah. drill and they usually don't have the smaller ones. Uh, so, but now that's where we always tell our clients, you you get on these different boards with NRCS and, and so forth to, to get those type of, uh, you know, equipment for small farmers in your area. Um, and the last thing Kyle I wanted to mention was you, you said the word holistic, you said happiness and, 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 you know, our quality of life when it comes to farming. One of the things that I have loved doing when, well, I've been farming my whole life, but when I did it on my own and my own business and my own money, uh, I always, I looked into holistic management. Mm -hmm. I, I just really love Alan Savory uh, and the Savory Institute and what he teaches and and just really have, have had an awesome time even meeting him, meeting him a couple of times. But holistic management really, really works. Uh, not just thinking about on the agriculture side, which it is, but also on that quality of life side, when you're really thinking about your goals for life and the generations to come. Um, but I really wanted to share that if, if people are just thinking about that, what, what am I gonna do next? Um, you know, with my farm, with my land, um, you know, start thinking about just that holistic management and how we can move into that for our, for our lives and stuff. Yeah. That's all I had. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, we work with Holistic Management International quite a bit on our uh, Soil for Water project, which is primarily a rangeland project to increase soil water holding capacity and improve soil health. And um, uh, they're great. And if you guys need a contact, uh, feel free to give me a call. We work with them a lot and they're great on what you just said of how is this going to, okay, how is this decision going to work with your family? How is this decision going to work with um, your business and kind of walking you through all those steps and they're terrific and Savory International 
uh, is great too. They're kind of same, same side of the coin, you know? Um, but yeah, they're all fantastic to work with. We really enjoy sure them. Is. Yeah. And, um, Ms. Tila said 20 in their two libraries, 20 to 30 people come in each week to borrow return twos. And she said she ran the seed table handling out, handing out harvested seeds and soil. That's phenomenal. That's great. Yeah. And then Mr. Russell said weather stations. That that what ha, that's what he utilizes on their farm um, to to keep up with what's going on and and some of those uh, different data points we need o over the years. Yeah, those are great. That's a you know what especially you know I think this is true everybody here in Texas. It may rain three inches on your farm, but it doesn't on you know about five miles down the road. So mm -hmm. I think that's, and yeah, don't always trust the weather on that. Monitoring is really great. It's real important. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Russell, because that, that's one of the things we, we have many pro research projects around the country working with our farmers on that and, and learning how to monitor. Uh, and, it's, and even though the words sound like you're going to be doing, you know, so much, but it really is things that Colin said today is really that, that feedback loop. You, you're supposed to go out there and observe. And so that's what monitoring is, but we try to share some of the tools we have learned as well as other institutions that have shared how to monitor if people don't know how to do that in, in their size. Uh, because uh, monitoring, experimenting is so important. Um, because you just, one, I'm a firm believer not to just spend so much money uh, when you wanna bring in a, a new practice or a new animal, you know, you know, you know versus 50 animals, you may only wanna bring in two and kinda, you know, if you find a good deal, it's like, okay, let me try this out for, you know, six months, a year, but, you know, hold me X amount of animals. You, you can work things out with people just to make sure um, because you, you, you'd be surprised. You may love animals, you may love different things, but when you bring it to your land, it doesn't work. And, and it's for many, many reasons. A lot of times we cannot put our finger on it, uh, but still just try, experiment, monitor, it really helps. So right now, um, I don't have any more questions. Um, if anyone wants to come off, We'll do that for the next few minutes and, and then we can close it out. I, I did find one thing on the Von Thunen's model of, of land use. And I had forgotten this. I actually learned this in college in a ag class I took. Um, and it is a, it was early in the 19th century, Johann Heinrich Von Thunen uh, developed a model of land use that showed how market processes could determine how land in different locations uh, would be used. Um, and I always remember this as drawing the circles and depending how far you are from the market, will determine uh, what you're basically going to do. And that's kind of that same zone theory that we're talking about. It would move, um, that is basically that zone theory. So basically you're saying the, the market itself will determine how we farm and where we farm and how large of so, area we need. Is, is so yeah, that, that what was, you're saying? That is one, yeah, um, iteration of that. Uh, theory. Mm. That's the one I learned in my agriculture development and economics course. Um, it was taught by a geographer, but um, mm -hmm. but I've also I've seen pictures of it applied to basically that zones we talked about, where it's like market gardening, crops, livestock, you know, firewood, things like that. Um, so that's what he was referring to. Wow. Okay. I thank you. Thanks for looking that up. No problem. Um. So. Oh. Let me see. No, Miss Miss Tila, I was just mentioning your comment. I didn't ask a question, but thanks, thanks. We th and I thank you so much. And I wanted to thank Miss Selena, I believe. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right for helping out answering questions in the chat. Uh, I'm a, I'm always saying that we're in this together. I love how farmers work together and, and we all need help. <laughs> it's just so much going on with these Zoom calls and, and we're trying to make sure that we're assisting all of you. So thank you so much for chiming in and answering questions. If anyone else wanna jump on and ask questions before we uh, 
get off with Colin. He's a wealth of information. So I'm like, we got him now. Of course, you can email him, but you, you got him live and well now. So <laughs> it's like, uh, jump on if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions. Yeah, feel free. If you can't think of me now, feel free to reach out, y'all. This is, this is what I'm here for. So. Well, I'll just say thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, this is such a great summarization of everything. And do you guys offer a course in permaculture design as, as an institute or agency? Um, no, we, we don't currently. Um, you know, it's something we could look into for sure. Um, you know, everything, all the courses we give are almost always free. Um, that's something I really enjoy about working with NCAT is that I can share this knowledge for free and go out and travel to meet y'all where y'all are at most of the time. COVID's messed that up a little bit, of course. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I think I, I do want to look into maybe making some more, more materials for ATRA to share some of these things. Um, and, you know, I think my opinion and ideas on permaculture has changed a little bit because I work with big row crop producers in the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, livestock producers, and every kind of shape, size, and form of uh, rancher, farmer, urban producer, you name it. So, um, but maybe in the future, we'll look at doing that. Definitely. I would, I'd be interested. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Yeah, thank you. And if it's not any other questions, definitely thank you all for joining us today, as well as um, stay informed with our website, our newsletter, um, our Facebook, however you are able to get this particular post, please stay connected to this. Um, we're so excited to be able to do the weekly Wednesday workshops. So we um, have one of our other ag specialists from that same office, the Southwest off with um, Justin next week, Colin. Um, he's supposed to be doing, I believe, cover crop. Um, but yeah. he's a quarter culture, so I'm going to kind of let him fly. <laughs> um, but he's just like Colin and all of our specialists, they, they have the expertise uh, in their discipline. And so we just wanted to share them with you. So if you're free next Wednesday, same time, same link, please join us for that as well. Yeah. Uh, and we also, if you have um, uh, actual topics you want to hear, or if you have uh, people or yourself or entities you want to share with us that want to come on. We would love to have them. This is not just about our specialists. I have interviewed so many people um, with far as farmers and entities, as well as some of our other partners for as our 1890s, 1862. Um, so if there's any topic that you would like to hear and see, please drop me, it, it drop Colin, um, mine um, is Felicia B, F-E-L-I-C-I-A, B as in boy, at NCAT.org. Um, and I appreciate anything because we, we're going to be keeping this up even if we're able to get back in the office. So I'm very elated about that. Um, so we love to do what you need from us. That's what we're here for. So have a great rest of the afternoon and we thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you all so much. And thanks, Felicia, for having me. And yeah, definitely make sure you tune in next, next week. Justin is a mad plant scientist, and he is awesome to listen to uh, when it comes to cover crops or anything. I miss <laughs> having him in my uh, office. Um, so thank you all again. And yeah, reach, yeah. if you all need anything, don't hesitate, y'all. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, y'all. <laughs>